want to do people want to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they're hoping to discuss tonight or what why they chose to participate we only have about 19 people so far and if we're going to wait another two or three minutes i'd love to get i'd love to hear from people are people for i i can i can i can start lovely uh, the reason I'm interested in is I live in a mixed neighborhood and uh, I've heard so much about racism and I believe it exists. And my personal philosophy is when I meet a black person, uh, I, there, there's, a, there's an ingrained prejudice that isn't really overcome until I speak to the black person and I can determine whether they're open to a conversation or whether they're angry. Usually the younger blacks are usually angry because of, because of the racism they, they experience. But the older black people are more open to conversation. And sometimes I, I make a judgment and then I have a conversation with the, with the person. And then I make another judgment whether I want to open myself up to them and have a conversation. And so far I've been successful. Every black person that I've approached, that I've met in the street, just saying, how are, how are you doing? Or hello, or how are you? They smile and they sincerely respond, but they don't stop for a conversation. So uh, I've also read uh, something about uh, a very famous black author. I forget his name. Uh, I think he wrote The Fire Next Time. Uh, he. He says, uh, don't trust Jewish people. So that surprised me. So I think there's an ingrained mistrust uh, by blacks of Jews because they don't feel that, that they're completely devoted to, towards open, openness and freedom and e equality. So uh, I'm interested in what the relationship is of the, black, of the black population to the white population in this country and internationally. And that's why I've signed up for this course. Great, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Eileen? Oh, you're muted, Eileen. There you go, I'm unmuted. So hi. Which Eileen do you want? No, no, two. What? Oh, go ahead, Arlene. Go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, you say something. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I, um, my name's Eileen Dwell, and I signed up for this series of discussions because being a child of the late 60s, early 70s, and having family involved uh, politically in the um, social the civil rights movement um i'm not on a day-to-day -day basis i'm not always so sure how far we've come i think that um prejudice is very subtle as opposed to being as blatant as it used to be and i think we need to be aware of subtleties in our own uh prejudices that we may not even realize that we have so i just thought that this is a good way of um, discovering my own and exploring what we can do to further bridge relationships because I think anti-Semitism is can be you know subtle or blatant likewise so can racism so I don't think it's as the author that I was sorry what the author that I was talking about is very famous and very well known. It was James Baldwin. Ah, yep. We will be talking a little bit about James Baldwin. Anyone else want to take a minute? I can. Regina. Hi, um, I'm an adoption social worker and I spend a great deal of my time, as I have been for a million years, um, educating white people adopting children of color and what their responsibility is um, and teaching them, you know, that racism still exists. Uh, you know, prior to Obama, you know, people kind of went, yeah, I get it. And then once we had a black president, a lot of people thought we were done with that conversation. 
and we're not, and we're back where we started from anyhow. But I've also always been interested in the connection between the Jewish community and the African-American community. And to know that rabbis were right there on the front lines of the march to Selma and in drafting the Civil Rights Act, I think we should be really proud of that and continue to do everything we can to battle racism um, just and hopefully that we will have the support of other minorities as we fight anti-Semitism. Thank you. That's really helpful to me. How about one more person want to want to share something with us? I'll share. Um, I uh, have been interested in issues of um, racism since I was a child. And um, I grew up in an all white community, but I um, had um, relatives who lived in South Africa. And so I became familiar when I was a child with apartheid. And I didn't really understand racism in the US, but I, from afar, I could see what was what I'd read about South Africa and I was um, appalled and I became an activist as a, as a young teenager. And then of course, learned more about the history of the US. So it's a topic that's been a lifelong involvement of mine. And um, on you know personal relationship level, um, while I don't consider myself a racist, I, I understand, I, I forget who said this before me about subtle forms of racism and, <clears throat> and racial signaling and so on. Um, I think it's interesting to learn about and be open to as um, white people. As Jewish people, we um, you know, have another challenge, an adjacent challenge with anti-Semitism, but I feel like most Jewish people who are white can not be so obvious. And I think people of color um, can't hide their color, so they're subject to a huge much amount more um, societal and um, um, just, you know, ingrained racism. Um, as a Jewish person, I know there are parts of the country I may not feel comfortable going to because I feel like I wouldn't be like welcome if it was known that I was Jewish. But I think like as a black person going to some places, especially with our, you know, um, the advent of cell phones and being able to um, see so much um, incidents of racism that we didn't have before cell phone vis video. It doesn't mean it wasn't going on. We just weren't seeing it. Um, for I think for people of color, um, there's, you know, a much deeper feeling of fear and being in certain places where you're not welcome as a person of color. But for Jews, I think we don't experience it as um, white Jews. That is, we don't experience it as um, strongly. So anyway, I'm interested in the conversation. That's why I'm here. Great, thank you. So last time we got to start a little bit talking about our individual identities, how we see ourselves as Jews, um, and how that relates to uh, how we see people as black and what is the relationship adding in. And I'll, I'll need to say this, I, I cannot say stress this enough. We recognize that we have a diverse community. Right? I don't wanna suggest in any way this is a binary of black or Jewish. There was a time when that was uh, uh, for the way that people looked at things and we understand that that is not the case. Um, there are times that that may be simplified, <clears throat> but we want to make sure that we recognize this throughout the conversations. Um, you brought up a lot of important issues, right? When we talk about, once we, once we take a minute to look at who, how we understand ourselves, um, understanding the relationship between communities is a way of how we, how we understand our history. Um, as we look at some of the history, it's complicated, right? Anytime you deal with Jews, the answer to almost everything is it's complicated. So the history between the black, the black community and the Jewish community is complicated. 
Right, so I have chosen and I, I have adjusted a little bit that based on what my experience of the last um, discussions. So I am, I have tried to set this up so there's a little more open ended discussions in small groups. Um, when we break you up to, into groups, we ask that you come back afterward and talk a little bit about <clears throat> whatever you want to talk about. Right, what well, this is the fun part about working with adults instead of kids. You, you actually have something to say that's on topic. I used to teach middle school. <clears throat> as someone as you used to teach middle school, I can't tell you how wonderful there is there is that I see a mute button if necessary. Um, so I'm going to send you off with- Can I say something before you do? Yeah, who's talking? Yes, of One course. One more thing. Who, who are you? Stan, Dr. Stanley oh, Silver. Dr. Stanley Silver. I see you. You were on the other screen. I had a flip over. I just, I just have a brief statement. My experience with black strangers is that black, when, when a black person meets a white person that they don't know, they, there is either fear or anger. Um, so wh why don't we, we talk a little bit about the history and then we can work our way up. I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to solve all the issues of racism today. But um, it, it's important to have an opportunity to talk it through, right? We want we we want to understand your experience so we can help think through what that might be like. Add a little something that, before we go into the groups, uh, um, just mm -hmm. to uh, to add to what to Dr. Stanley was saying. Um, mm -hmm. It's not always fear or um, distrust. Some sometimes it's just uncertainty that Black people experience when they experience white people. We're just not sure where white people are going to land, how we need to operate so that we can, um, like I work in a, I work on a college campus as a, it is a, what we call a P PWI, a predominantly white institution. Most of my coworkers are white. When I started this job two years ago, I just wasn't sure how I was going to encounter people or how they were going to experience me in being myself. So it's not always fear or anger, it's oftentimes uncertainty, which can lead to fear or anger or lots of different things, not just those two binaries, but it's not usually that front, it is usually uncertainty, is what I would, is what I would add to that before we uh, split off. I, I think you can say that to some degree about any stranger you meet on the street. <clears throat> if you start a conversation with someone on the street, um, whoever that person is could very well be very uncertain. Right. Uh, There's just a, a, a complete history and basis for there to be that. So absolutely. I add that it's not just fear or anger. I'm not always angry. I'm happy generally. I'm just no, not sure how you're going to experience me and how I need to react in that moment and live in that moment. Because okay. oftentimes we cannot be ourselves. We're not allowed to experience that that way. But I, I would love to have conversation. I don't want to make this a, a one. I just wanted to add that. No, it's important. We want to be able to address people's concerns. Okay, so I pulled together a few texts that um, I'd like everybody to take a look at. And this is about the history. Do we, do we need, do, do people have questions? Let me just intro it, it'll just be faster. There is a relationship between the Black and Jewish communities. There must be, because there are so many books written about the falling apart of the relationship between the Black and the Jewish communities. If there hadn't been one, we wouldn't need all these books telling us about it. Right? There is clearly something there. That, that history exists. It's complicated. It's really interesting. All right, and we're going to take a look at, we're going to start back. The first text I have here is from 1885. All right. <clears throat> Just sort of take a look at them, and I have just a few questions when I break you up. So, did this work? Did that work? Yeah. Great. Let me see if I can get everybody's picture back up for me. Uh, no, but we'll we'll muddle through. Okay. So. For the purposes of a dialogue guidelines, when you break up into groups, we want to make sure everybody feels comfortable talking. Right? We're going to assume everyone has the best of intention. All questions are sincere. Um, 
<clears throat> if you're uncomfortable with some what someone is sharing, you know, we just don't call people a racist. It's not going to encourage dialogue or any way. Um, <clears throat> if you're not sure what someone said, or if you're offended by what someone said, ask a question instead of uh, characterizing it or even repeating it back to them. Just ask them if they can clarify it. Make, make sure you understand them. Um, <clears throat> I statements, right? What I'm hearing you say is, and Harris Sokoloff, who does dialogue trainings as, par as part of what he does for a living, once said in a meeting, and I thought it was very beautiful, come to the conversation willing to be changed. So as you have a chance to have your conversations, Think about who you are and who you, and how you're going to be different when you leave. <clears throat> I picked a few of the words we looked at last week. Right? You can write these down. You can pick one that particularly interests you. You can, and again, one of the wonderful things about this being a group of adults, you can ignore me entirely and talk about whatever you want to talk about. Right? Structural or systemic racism, personal racism, power privilege, class, and intersectionality. We're going to be talking a lot about intersectionality later. Right? So if you take a look at those words and think about how those concepts apply to the text I'm going to put on screen. And just for the first piece, and just go up to the AJC piece, right? just those first couple of pages. What do you see in terms of the nature of the relationship between the Black and Jewish communities? How would you characterize that relationship? Do you see something change as, the, as we go through history? What particularly struck you and why? And how are the vocabulary words reflected in those texts? These are not the definitive list of texts of the history of the Jewish and Black communities relationship. They're just some texts that I thought were interesting. And you may very ha well have others that would even be better, and I would love to hear them. <clears throat> but uh, Jason sent these out. Wait, did the screen change for you? Did it change for you, Jason? OK. Um, Jason sent these out a little while ago. If we break into groups, do we know if these stay on the screen? Or you should have them. They won't stay on the screen. You should have these. Yeah, they were mailed to all registrants earlier, so everyone should have received them. Do we, do, is there anybody who doesn't have them? And you'll no, have them. You can't actually. Uh, I don't have them. I didn't pre-register. Aha. OK. Is there anyone else who doesn't have them? It's just hard for us to see it. Well, they were sent to you. Can you see the text? You can't see the text? It's not so easy to be on a Zoom and have your text on the screen unless you've printed them out. It's a little mm -hmm. complicated. Would it be better if we read them together and then you'll have and then you can break up into your groups? I'm sorry, the technological issues are still pretty new, so I apologize if this is harder. <clears throat> would it help to get them sooner next time? It would help no. to not have 11 pages to print. If it were just a couple pages, then I would have printed them, but I wasn't going to print 11 pages. Okay. Do you have um, Do you have a cell phone that you can look at? You can pull them up on your cell phone and look at them on your cell phone during the conversation. We sent them out earlier today in the hopes that they would be toward the top of your inbox and easier to access. Uh, Bacha, one thing that helps is if people go to the top of their screen with their cursor and click on the view options and go to 100% uh, original size, that makes it bigger. I mean, you can click on you know 150 or 200%, but it may take it off the page. So either fit to window or I've got mine on 100% original size and it's reasonably good. Yeah, but will it be there when we go into groups? It won't. Maybe, that's the problem. Maybe, maybe that's problem. Do, you, do you have a phone that you yeah, can? Yeah, but it's really small to read on the phone, Batya. So, yeah. 
It would be really small to read on the phone. Maybe once we break into the groups, if at least one person in each group could bring up the document and read it aloud to the group, then we could discuss it in the groups that way. Okay. Either that or we could read them together now before breaking into groups. Or we can just discuss them in a large group. If there's too much text and that's not working for people, it's, it's actually working as a large group better than I had been, better than I had feared. So we can actually just look at them together. And I think I can make it bigger also. Let's see. Yeah, if you zoom your screen, it'll be larger for everyone. Okay, how do I zoom my screen? There you go. All right, we'll just look at them together and we'll discuss them together. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Would someone like to read the Pittsburgh platform from the reform movement in 1885? I can read Go ahead, it. Marcy. Marcy's got her hand up first. She beat you, Steve. Okay. Yes, but Marcy, you're, you're muted. I, I just unmuted. Reform Movement, Pittsburgh Platform, 1885. We deem it our duty to participate in the problems presented by the contrasts and evils of the present organization of society. Okay. Who wants to take Paul Robeson? Steve? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure what this is, what this is saying. The Jewish sigh, and I don't know if that's tear or tear, or yeah. tear. I guess it's the Jewish sign and tear are close to me, Jewish feelings. I feel that these people are closer to the traditions of my race. I guess that's it. Now, does somebody want to characterize those? It would seem to me that, that both the, from the Jewish angle and the African-American viewpoint, uh, Jews and African Americans were seen as having similar issues and had had a um, I'm not sure I know they were, have the right word at the top of my head, but there was a simpatico between the two. People Absolutely. understood that when when we sing um, "Go Down Moses" at our Seder, that's a gospel hymn. So there's a, a relationship between the two groups that go back many, many years. Absolutely. Well, the, the statement of the Pittsburgh platform seems pretty euphemistic or um, um, kind of superficial and not really willing to name the issue. And so we, we are to imply from this that they're talking about that it's, it's referring to racism among and, and inequality among the contrasts and evils of the present organization of society. Um, I would be careful about reading too, too much into it since it is a one sentence excerpt. Well, it was extracted from something. <laughs> right, but you know, what, the, rest, the rest of it does not necessarily imply that it's uh, it, it, it's meant to be euphemistic. So okay, but then if, if one sentence is taken from a larger document, and meant, I mean, it, presumably it's meant to be reflective of the document, so. I can and, comment. And I, I did not have the larger document. I took it from a book that chose this excerpt. I, I do know something about the Pittsburgh platform, Ms. George. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there were, there's a section of it that deals with what we would now call tikkun olam or social justice. And it's, this is a statement from that. It, there was not a section on race specifically. There was a recognition that Jews benefited from the society and need, our society and needed to recognize. Actually, this is a recognition in part that there were still parts of our society that were not beneficial to Jews. Can I say something? <laughs> well, well I'd, I'd like to go on and read it, read it a few more texts, if that's okay, Dr. Silver. All right. I just want to make sure we get to cover some, some of the texts. So let, let's give it the most generous possible interpretation, because those are, <laughs> those are sort of the most straightforward texts. We're going we're gonna to add a little complexity into the discussion now. 
So this is a letter from Walter White, who's head of the NAACP in 1938, um, to the Hornstein Brothers Stationery Store. Somebody want to read that one? I can make it darker or larger. I'll read it, Patia. Would it be helpful if it were darker? Um, no, I, I can read it. Is that better? Okay. Um, great. Gentlemen, I am the individual to whose son you sold a basketball, about which I called your store recently. You made the statement that you guaranteed everything that went out of your store. White recounts how the poorly made ball fell apart. I neither expect nor ask any adjustment since your manner the other night showed the type of person you are. I want to say this to you, however, as members of a race which at this particular stage of the world's history should be busily engaged in making friends instead of more enemies, particularly in view of the news out of Germany during the last three days, Kristallnacht, I have been exceedingly fortunate in that I have the opportunity of knowing honorable and decent Jews, like Governor Lehman. But I want to say to you quite candidly that your type of merchant selling shoddy goods are doing more to build up anti-Semitism than some of you appear to realize. Having for many years opposed anti-Semitism in the US and elsewhere, you can imagine <coughs> what effect conduct like yours has upon persons like myself. Can I say something? Sure, Dr. Silver. I think the most famous form of cooperation of Jewish people with <laughs> the black movement was envisioned, was, was shown uh, in, Ab by Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Martin Luther King at the, at the bridge at Selma and took all that abuse and torture that, that they took at, right by his side. That was the most the yeah. Jews has have, have ever done for the black people and has had the greatest effect on black attitude towards Jews. Okay, well, right now we're still in the 1930s. So let's give it a little time before we get up to the 1960s. Right, and these, these quotes are taken from this book, Troubling the Waters, mm -hmm. by Cheryl Lynn Greenberg, the Black Jewish Relations in the American Century. Um, this is not from the book. So, what was the date on that letter? What was the date on Walter Wright's letter? 1938. 38? Yeah. Whoa. All right. We go, we'll go ahead a little bit. 1944. Somebody want to describe the picture? <laughs> this is from the Black Press. Uh -huh. I mean, it would seem to be... <laughs> Uh, showing that here the U.S. is going to um, free, quote, slaves in Europe, when in fact, yeah. here in the America, there are still people that are in one way or another enslaved. This yeah. would have been Jim Crow era. Absolutely. And I, I t actually went to a seminar that talked about um, the way the black press uh, political cartoons were different from the white press. Needless to say, the white press didn't make these analogies and relationships. And there are a number of ways in which Nazi Germany, Germany used America as a model. Uh, some of the laws were based off the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s. Right? Um, there, the black press were not the only people who recognized similarities. So this, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it off the screen. So... This, I actually kind of find it kind of horrifying, but it was an, AD, an AJ Congress um, jingle that was supposed to be in support of the black community. So it tells you a little bit of 1946. Would, would someone like to read that aloud? <laughs> Sad. <laughs> oh, somebody, please, I don't want to do it. Here you go. I'll do it. Um, you can get good milk from a brown skilled cow. The color of the skin don't matter, no how. Ho, 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 ha, ha, ha. You can learn common sense at the grocery store. 
Hmm. Okay, so that's kind Thank of- Thank you for that. I wasn't sure how it rhymed, but she made it rhyme so great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how wonderful that rhyme. Okay, so first we can all be grateful it's not the 1940s for ever so many reasons. Um, <clears throat> but that was understood as uh, encouraging people to be open-minded. And it, it's again, the idea of racism is that it's just a personal prejudice. Like if you could only, you know, if you only think about it as not, you know, it's just, just, just think about things differently and you're fine. Good milk comes from cows of all colors. Right, exactly. Um, I, I believe they meant well. Would someone like to read the next one? 1947. part between the Jews who want to keep blacks out and the Jews who want to let them in. This is regard to the national theater integration. Thank you, yes. Right. Um, just a reminder, there are these Jews and those Jews. We are, we do not, you may have noticed, we do not all agree. Not all the Jews agree. Not all Jewish organizations agree. We don't all agree about goals. We don't all agree about strategy or tactics. That is true in the black community as well. As you go through, you see different organizations have different understandings of what is the best way to approach the civil rights movement. So when you talk about the relationships between the communities, particularly if you're talking about organizational relationships, it's complicated. Okay. Um, if you want to take a look, so let's look at the vocabulary for a second. Uh, these ideas that we've looked at, are they about personal racism or structural racism? I want to uh, <laughs> kind of shift the, the language of personal racism to more Thank individual you. racist act versus personal racism because personal makes it sound like, it, it makes it seem like pers it's personal to one person but it's not necessarily racism. It's kind of a nuance on the word or, or Maybe okay. semantics, but it's more a uh, individual racist act more than personal racism from one to another. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. I'll, um, I want to say it's also attitude. Right? It would be acts, but also attitude. Right. But it's it's about your individual thing. You just need to think about things differently. Mm -hmm. um, do you see? And you don't see anything, you, that's not true. Which of these texts dealt with issues of power, privilege, and class? Most explicitly. Actually, several of them do actually. I think the, the letter, the, the letter to Hornstein. Right. What, what, are, what, what were the assumptions built into that letter? Um, the, uh, the Walter Wright assumed that um, a Jewish merchant was not going to make good on a product sold to a black man. Oh no, he he actually didn't make good. I mean, he, the, the way the letter is written, he actually went back to the department store to fix it, and was was treated very poorly. Right. But it's not just that he yeah. didn't do it, but it reflects on all the Jews. Yeah. You should behave better. You're, you are causing anti-Semitism because you as a merchant are dealing poorly with others. Right. And I really want to emphasize that now because those ideas, are they come up again and again. Um, they're not- both, both ways. What do you mean both ways? Both ways. I mean, it, it, whites have stereotypes of, of blacks and if one person confirms it, all you people are like that. And it goes both ways between the Jewish community and the black community and the black community and the Jewish community on, on individual basis. True. But this particular theme that the Jews are more privileged, they have more money, and they're in a position to exploit the black community and members of the black community. Mm -hmm. But isn't it true? 
I mean, we'd have to go back to that year, but I think today we could say percentage wise, you know, white Jews have how much wealth compared to the African American community? How many businesses are, are owned? Um, I think what would be interesting about this um, letter was, did Hornstein, um, if a white person had returned a ball that had fallen apart, would that person have gotten different treatment than um, the African American family who returned the ball? We don't know that from this letter. We do not. Or if he had bought the ball from an Italian, not Jewish merchant, would he have generalized about Italians uh, in, in the consequence of the action? Right. Right. I, I don't think that this is necessarily about um, black versus Jewish. I think that this is because the merchant was Jewish if the purchaser was white Christian, they might have had the same reaction. But, this is more, but, to me, anti-Semitism. It is an ongoing theme. Well, first of all, black people were treated worse in stores. They just were, right? It is so- And may still be. We can, uh, I don't think it's a big leap to that, right? Black people were treated worse in stores. I think we can assume that. I actually appreciate how Walter White managed to slip in there that he knows the governor. I thought that was very skillfully done. Um, but th this theme of the Jewish merchant in the neighborhood exploiting the black residents in the neighborhood is an ongoing theme. And it you will see it again and again. And often, we'll go forward a little bit later, but it, through history, as Jews became wealthier, they often moved out. The neighborhood became black and the Jews ran the stores. And this issue remains an area of conflict for decades. And I hope it's changing. And, and the Jewish stores, when, when the um, race riots occurred in 1964 and 1968, were were destroyed. People died, and there were livelihoods that uh, that were destroyed as well. Yes, <clears throat> right. And um... but your original question was about class and um, power, I think. Yeah. And I have to say, like two things. One thing, it isn't clear for me that in that the location of the stores in the hood, like uh, in the neighborhood of of blacks, that isn't clear for me from here and, and the author like it could have just been a downtown store we don't know that but and the other piece of it is the the author of the letter is dropping names that he's buds with the governor so that's as much about class as you know and power as anything else here i think it's a i don't i, I didn't see it quite the way it's been characterized here Thanks. Yeah, I mean, what I found disturbing about that letter was um, the authors uh, attributing to the Jews as a people the bad behavior of a single Jew mm -hmm. and saying your behavior reflects on your people and therefore I'm forgiven if I'm anti-Semitic because you as a Jewish person have done something bad. And that's disturbing in this case, just as it's disturbing when uh, someone points to a Jew and says a Jew did something bad and then generalizes about Jews. And that is a theme, this exact theme that you see in this letter in 1938. And one, one auto also- exploiting the black customers. They're charging one higher vote. prices, they're charging shoddy goods, selling shoddy goods, they're treating them poorly, and the we Jews should know better. We, we need Dan, to I'm sorry. That we need to realize that the, um, I think that um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know who this kind of generalizing is something that people do, white people, some white people, about black people. And I think <laughs> some Jews do it about <laughs> black people. Um, and other, probably other minorities. It, it, it is not something um, that um, Walter White invented. 
nor has it stopped. And, and, and I think I would assume that that's <laughs> an issue that we would think the Jewish community needs to deal with. Yeah, but can I, am I on now? I'm not yeah, sure how this okay. works. But I mean, don't we do that to ourselves as well? Because aren't we totally embarrassed when people like uh, have the last name Epstein and Cohen and they're imprisoned or their name is Steve Miller and they behave a certain way? Aren't we as, as a group embarrassed by these behaviors? So we do it to ourselves as well because in fact, uh, generalizations are made very often that uh, those people represent their uh, their religion in many ways. Um, so this concept of Mari Ayan, right? You're giving you're, you're, you you know Bilul Hashem. You're giving the Jews a bad name. But this idea that the Jews cheat the blacks, um, they 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 don't deal ethically in business, uh, is a theme in the relationship between communities. One, one ought to note too, and I, I think this sort of heightens the interest in this letter, Walter White was not just a, a little guy in the NAACP. Right. He's, a, he's a, I mean, a, a giant in history. He was the head of the national NAACP at a very critical period. Yes. So Absolutely. it's not just, a, it's not just a, a Joe Blow on the street. And, and also, he does, he does say that he has, he's had the opportunity to know honorable and decent Jews. Um, but I'm saying to Hornstein, but, you know, the kind of thing that you're doing, you know, contributes to anti-Semitism, which is actually what James Baldwin says in the, the, that piece that you also included, that, yeah, it's great that Jews were, there were many Jews involved in the civil rights movement, but for most Blacks, their interactions with Jews are, you know, the Jew who runs the, uh, the, the landlord, the, the pawn shop owner, um, the merchant who, who it, it takes advantage of Blacks. Your type of merchant. Yeah. Can I add something here, Batya? Sure. This is Candy Berlin. Oh, hi, Candy. Candy Berlin. Yeah, um, I want to say that when I read the letter, it was clear to me that um, I think it was Mr. White was someone who is probably of a um, higher socioeconomic class than the store owner. Um, I had the feeling that the store owner might be less educated. Um, obviously, the letter is written by um, someone who's highly educated. And also, as someone pointed out before, he's dropping names. Um, uh, and for a store owner to treat a customer um, of any race poorly, um, to me would suggest that he's not an educated person. Um, but beyond that, when uh, someone just mentioned um, that Walter White was um, very prominent in the NAACP, I want to say that I will suggest that he was very familiar with having to represent his whole race by being like better than perfect. And so it wouldn't be a stretch for him to then chastise a Jewish person and say, you're representing your whole race of people. That would have been something he himself experienced. And he sort of, my guess is he carried that burden. And so that was something that was not just a personal kind of anti-Semitism or racism on his part, uh, on his part but it was something that was probably in the air then and um, expected of both Blacks and Jews. Yes, I think that probably characterizes 1938 to a great degree. Okay. I think, uh, you know, one of the, a theme that's really uh, embedded here mm -hmm. is the notion of, of group identity and group reputation. And it works, and it works both ways. You know, in, uh, you know, in Walter White's letter, you know, he says, uh, but I want to see you, I want to say to you quite candidly that your type of merchants selling shoddy goods are doing more to build up anti-Semitism than some of you appear to realize. And I think that line, some of you appear to realize, meaning you Jews. And here's a man who has got, as, as has been said, 
uh, a leadership position in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. So you know, his position is dedicated, his job is to uh, help protect and advance the reputation, presumably, as well as the you know the living standards mm -hmm. of you know of black people. Uh, but here he's you know uh, commenting on the reputation of of the of the Jews, and it's this sort of groupthink or not, not groupthink, but focusing on group identity and group reputation that I think is problematic both ways. And I think it's you know it's common. Here to, to both Jews and Blacks in this context. I just wanted to add that it, it seemed like to me that the, the, um, the degree that Walter White uh, expresses negative sentiments, the store owner is kind of textual, but the, the direction of the exploitation is happening the other way. I mean, the actual event is in the other direction. So. Yes. Right. Walter White and Wright was actually on the receiving end of the shoddy merchandise. And that also continues to be a theme throughout history. We're going to take a look. This is Martin Luther King's speech when he uh, receives an award from AKC. And I just highlighted a few points of it. Uh, so one of the reasons I chose this First of all, it's just beautifully written, and that's always nice to read. It also, I find it interesting the way King chooses to quote AJC's documents, and and I'm interested to see how it sounds to you, because I know I find it very interesting. Somebody want to read just the part I have in yellow? Can you see it? It's a funky font, so I'm not sure. No, it's fine. Jews cannot ensure equality for themselves unless it is assured for all. And then later, the crisis resulting from a century of denial by the white majority of the Negro Americans' basic human rights is not a Negro problem. It is a challenge calling for a moral commitment by Americans of every race and religion and of every section of the country. Right. So that, that is King quoting AJC's documents. What, what AJC understands its mission to be. So that, let's get to the, let's, let's go to the bottom and discuss it. And let's just look at the year real quick while I'm up here, 1965. Okay. Somebody want to read that next paragraph? If Protestants and Catholics had engaged in nonviolent direct action, and had made the oppression of the Jews their very own oppression and had come into the streets beside the Jew to scrub the sidewalks and had Gentiles worn the stigma, stigmatizing yellow armbands by the millions, a unique form of mass resistance to the Nazi regime might have developed. I am fully aware of the terror, the intimidation, the brutality and the force of the fascists were so quick to use but I am also aware that in the South today, some racists of the same mentality have been curbed in their resistance to nonviolent action when practiced on a mass scale. And then it's, you highlighted anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, but that's an out of a sentence. Yeah, it's just, a, it's just in the middle because that is also a theme that you see in, um, in ways in which the members of the black community express empathy with members of the Jewish community. Um, so it's a definitely a text of, of, of empathy. Does anyone see anything else there? Well, it seems to me this is an example, a positive example of, in a sense, intersectionality or, or the, the notion that if people work together across various divisions, they can, <coughs> they have more of an opportunity of succeeding uh, in making things better for themselves and for other groups. And, and, the, and the AJC's um, the statement at the, on, up above made it very clear that that was what the AJC, American Jewish Committee, thinks. Jews can't ensure equality for themselves unless it's assured for all. 
Um, so. All right, beautiful. Does, does anybody else hear a rebuke in that? I, I didn't hear a rebuke, but I mean, to me, it sounds really um, relevant today when you consider that a, you know, a palpable threat to Jews in America are, you know, neo-Nazi fascists. And these are the same folks that threaten black people. And so, I mean, if, I mean, Jews have a, an interest in fighting, you know, black, anti-black racism, because uh, it's the same forces that, that are threatening us. Absolutely. And that is part of the AJC's mission. No, nobody else hears this at all as MLK rebuking the Jews? About what? Nobody, I, when, when I read it, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful speech. There is no greater ardor than MLK, but I, and it's artful. But I hear a little bit of where the hell are you? I do too, because he goes on and talks about the greatest evil not being prejudice or oppression, but silence. And so I think it's easy to read a subtext into there to say, it's not enough to um, profess ideals uh, that are compatible with brotherhood and non-prejudice, non-racism. Um, you need to speak up and act. Um, in the way that he quotes, you know, Rabbi Prince doing um, uh, that, you know, silence is is the biggest evil. And and there is no question, MLK had very close relationships with many Jews who were active in the civil rights movement. That is also absolutely true. I think in the letter from the Birmingham jail, he's even more explicit in calling out the Jews and their silence. This one is is still kind of tame, I think, compared well, to that. He's accepting a, an award from them. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think, though, is not, it, I wouldn't call it, you called it a rebuke, um, rebuking. I don't call it rebuking. I call it a call to action in front of the group that is, that is expressing um, gratitude to him. He's saying, okay, I accept this gratitude and I'm calling you to action more than I'm rebuking that you're not necessarily here. So it's more of an invitation um, to join closer the fight for, I guess, on a larger scale than it is for um, some, those who chose to act individually. I, I, I may be reading it through white guilt, which is definitely a possibility, um, but I would agree, absolutely, it is a call to action. Nancy? Um, I was just gonna say, I think uh, Tichelle is uh, letting us off the hook there, because I, <laughs> she's being much too diplomatic. Um, what I, took from that is sort of like when we go to shul on the high holy days and we're all sitting there in synagogue thinking we're so you know wonderful but we get a lecture from the rabbi saying where are you the other 364 days of the year and it's true what i hear from that speech or that lecture or whatever you want to call it is what would we be thinking if there was a jewish leader uttering those same words to us. And, you know, I think the voice speaking the words makes a difference. And I don't think we would be taking offense or umbrage or, uh, you know, exception if a Jewish leader was saying those words to us. So why should we be offended by a Black leader saying those words? He's calling it like he sees it. I don't think anyone's offended. Just so you know, he is an accepting an award at the AJC meeting. I doubt there was a person in that room that heard it as a rebuke or as a call to action. I'm sure they all heard it as a call to action and they were all committed to that. Absolutely, no, he was, it was, it, it was a very beautiful speech. I'm drawing a parallel between, um, I don't know if anyone's read Ibram, Ibram Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, but that that call to action in the silence, it's not enough to be a non-racist or not racist, but we have to be anti-racist. Um, and, you know, in 2020, we are experiencing the same issues as when MLK received that reward. Can you, can you see this? I can't see. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anti-racist. Right. So the, the resource book you received has an excerpt from that, which includes a list of statements on how to be exactly that, an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to say, too, I think in, in, in putting both of those last comments that came after mine, because um, I can't see the person's face anymore, Melissa, but before that as well, when we're talking about um, this uh, being anti-racist or, or, or looking at the silence, we also have to look at um, who, like who, when we talk about who's speaking, um, it is. It's when we talk, I think, Melissa, last week you talked about um, reading um, uh, Robin D'Angelo. She talks about in her work and even in the book that you both, that you referenced, that you also said was a part of that, um, Rabbi Glazer, that um, it does matter sometimes who the person speaking is because you feel more akin to being able to listen. Not everybody is listening to um, Ibram Kendi the way they're listening to Robin D'Angelo now, the same way people are willing to listen and hold up Martin Luther King, but not necessarily a Malcolm X, right? Like it's easier to hear Martin Luther King because he used nonviolence, because he was religious than it is for Malcolm X who decided to, ex to exit from a religion and who was not about who was not only it was not only just about anti um, nonviolence, but was also about any means necessary. So I think sometimes the audience matters because people don't want to hear. And even in even in the ground rules that we set, don't call anyone a racist. Um, I think people take more issue with hearing something that they think is going to attach bad to themselves than actually doing the work that they know is necessary. But I don't want to hear you call me a racist. I don't want to hear you say that Jews aren't doing the work, but if you, but if a Jewish person were to say it to you, you would, if your rabbi, your personal rabbi was to say it to you, you'd say, let me think about that. Let me think about how I approach that and may be able to do more work than if a black person said, Jews are not doing enough. I totally agree with that. And in fact, when I started Robin D'Angelo's book, I'm just going to be honest that within the first couple of pages, I Googled her to say, is she white calling me a racist or she black calling me a racist and it was more palatable that she was a white woman um you know middle-aged calling me a and racist a poor white, and a poor white woman for some folks because some people will think that well she's rich she doesn't know my struggle as a poor right woman. no she grew up exactly she grew up poor and um so yes it was definitely something that i had to shine the mirror up I couldn't help but shine the mirror up when she's staring at me saying, I'm white, you're white, we're both racist, and how to unpack that. And Ibram Kendi is actually much kinder. His language yes. wasn't called yes. anything racist. Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna move up to a, a different period in history. Um, I do, Sheila mentioned James Baldwin's piece, Jews are anti, or, or, what was the example, what was the title? Jews are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. No, blacks are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. Let me find it. I could find it, but it will be, I think it will be faster for me just to open to it and just hold up the general piece. Here it is. Um, it's, Batya is, is from your first session from the first set of materials, it was, the title was Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. Yes, and it's also in the resource book. So this is what it looks like. But I'm, I'm just, so I'm not sure which tab it's on. I'm just gonna read right at the very end. If one blames the Jew for not having been ennobled by oppression, one is not indicting the single figure of the Jew, but the entire human race. And one is also making quite a breathtaking claim for oneself. I know that my own oppression did not ennoble me, not even when I thought of myself as a practicing Christian. I know that if today I refuse to hate Jews or anybody else, it is because I know how it feels to be hated. I learned this from Christians and I cease to practice what the Christians practice. The crisis taking place in the world and in the minds and hearts of black men everywhere is not produced by the Star of David, but by the old rugged Roman cross from which Christendom's most celebrated Jew was murdered, and not by Jews. And so it's a piece about black anti-Semitism, but ultimately he condemns the Christians, which I thought was very interesting. It's, it's really, it's, it's a very interesting piece. 
And he actually has another piece that came out shortly before this on, um, the, I can't remember the title, but it's a black response to Christianity. And there is a piece by Robert Bordas that responds to it, which is not nearly so well written, frankly, uh, but it's only avail available on like that microfiche kind of setup and you can't just print it out. Um, so let's talk about a couple of events that I think had an impact on how people who haven't been paying much attention thought about the relationships before between communities. And, and I can also say, I think we're in a different world now than we were before the current administration. So th this was a slightly different time in terms of um, how, or in terms of everything, right? Black Lives Matter platform that condemned Israel as an apartheid state that was practicing genocide against the Palestinians. People remember um, their reaction to that when it when it came out. Okay. Yeah. Would someone like to share. I would. Uh, this is uh, Dan Siegel. I was. I was very troubled with it because it seemed um, it seemed unnes un unnecessary for within the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. And what it was, what it sort of said to me was, "Hey, if you don't think that Palestine, that, that Israel is an apartheid state with all the strong language that that, that implies." Um, then you can't be part of Black Lives Matter. It's sort of, it is in the way that uh, somebody pointed out to the positive, the positive notion of intersectionality. Inclusive. This is inclusive. This is an exclusive notion of intersectionality that is um, that is far too frequent now, <laughs> uh, at least in at least in my view. And, uh, and I know, you know, Israel's position in a number of areas, at least from, from my perspective, makes it, makes it difficult. But nevertheless, I think there's the notion of intersectionality, of exclusive intersectionality is damaging to both the black and the Jewish community, and most importantly, to the relationship between the two of them. Anyone else? I find this um, to be a troubling uh, thought process because the black community, if we're looking at them as a community because they share a shared identity, um, not all black community are akin to or, 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 or a part of Black Lives Matter, right? If we're talking about all Jews, we're not talking about just white Jews. So if we're talking about all black people, we're not talking about just people who coin the term and then are a part of a movement of the Black Lives Matter movement. I would say Black Lives Matter, but I'm not necessarily, uh, I haven't written on what they talk about when it comes to um, Palestine, right? Like I'm not necessarily well versed in that part of, of what their movement says, but what I say Black Lives Matter as a, as a, as a statement, absolutely. So I think um, one of the things when I was reading some of the, um, the, the, I guess the pieces that you put up here were that as a, as I think it's a luxury for people to be able to converse uh, internationally times for black people. A lot of black people are not looking at um, Jews as uh, anti-black, but looking at Jews in a whole as a part of the white community. So they're not necessarily sussing that out. Um, it, it, Black Lives Matter may, but I don't think that that's a, 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 the entire Black community. So I think it's hard when we're saying, well, the, the relationship between Blacks and Jews, well, are all Jews um, uh, looking at Israel as apartheid state? No. So are all Blacks looking at um, Jews as a part of feeling that it's an apartheid state? I think it's, I think we're part, I think we're putting it two large communities into two small communities and saying these people, th these, these groups are not congruent in how they feel about, uh, Jew about uh, Israel and Palestine and or the black community. I think those are two um, different things. I was not aware that 
people, people that Jewish people were not white until I was an adult. So sure. when I saw Jewish people, I saw white people. Um, and because that was the experience that I had with folks, but I wasn't I wasn't thinking about them as a part of apartheid state or or not a part of it. Right. I think so. Uh, but I, but I, I wanna one second, Arlene. I just wanna I, I, I wanna reinforce what Michelle said is none of these things are about all the communities. There are no one community, there's no one black community, there's one Jewish, no one Jewish community. There are sort of different communities and different organizations within those communities. There's fabulous amounts of disagreement. People come together, people split apart. It's complicated. Yeah, Sorry, Arlene, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But I'm sorry. No, but I, I was going to, I was it is a good point that this doesn't represent the entire black community. I think though, when it happened, um, when the movement for black lives first came on the scene, uh, there were many, myself, many Jews were very supportive uh, of their platform, let's say, or what they spoke about. Uh, like I know Truoff, for example, was very supportive. And it's that the use of the word genocide, you know, against Israel, I, I certainly have a lot of criticism of Israel, but it seemed unnecessarily provocative or unnecessarily uh, targeting. Now, I don't think that that's the entire black community, but it's that community, you know, the question is, how did that statement make us feel? What make me feel? Uh, it made me feel really, in a way, both sad and upset and angry. And I think that for, for the lefty Jews in the world who really wanted to enthusiastically support the Black Lives Matter movement and really wanted to oppose racism, that felt like a betrayal. Because that little tiny piece of text which really doesn't, didn't seem to have anything to do with this focus of the document, seemed um, a gratuitous attack. So I'm gonna tell someone else's story. Wait, wait if just a second, um, mm -hmm. uh, if I could. Sure. So um, I was um, living in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. when uh, the black light, when um, Ferguson erupted and Michael Brown was murdered and, um, Black Lives Matter started, and um, and I am still a member of the Memphis chapter of Black Lives Matter. And I remember the moment that that platform came out and that little tiny sentence out of a giant platform uh, did it. And I remember having a discussion with the JCRC director then who up till then, I didn't see one comment about Black Lives Matter. But once that sentence was in there, <laughs> They were there was like you know all over the newspaper and a statement and disassociating from Black Lives Matter and um, and I felt like there was a relief that now they could disassociate and I remember saying to her yeah there's that sentence in there but I have to say like the rest of the platform I'm there so I and I'm you know she knows I'm I hold dual citizenship I said. I am willing to set that aside because the majority of what they stand for, I stand for too. And, um, but that was a real difficult moment for me. And mind you, I was a bit of an outsider, but then so was she, I have to say, in the Memphis community. But I really felt almost like a sigh of relief. We don't have to be a part of this and make the hard decisions. So just wanted to say that. That was not, that was not what I heard from the people I spent time with. But I will tell you someone else's story. The, um, and if you are interested in looking this up, uh, BJ, the congregation in New York City, did a series of discussions on racism. Theirs were much higher budget. Um, Yehuda Kurtzer was one of the speakers. Um, and one of the speakers for one of the sessions was a uh, Jew of color, black, who was the JCRC director in San Francisco at this time and they the the professional Jews uh, asked the Black Lives Matter leadership in San Francisco for a meeting and they got there 
And she said she actually was fabulously embarrassed by how unprepared they were to have this intercultural conversation. But she thought they were, she thought that they were pretty embarrassing, frankly. Um, but they asked her to speak on their behalf. So she spoke to them and said, this document is really meaningful to me. It's really powerful and important. Um, and I thank you for doing this work. We would like to understand how this text got in there, this one section. And they said, this is a huge document. There is a few lines about Israel, nothing about the Jews. And all you can talk about is yourselves. They're not wrong. Is there more to the story? And then after that, what happened? Um, I think the rest of history happened. I, she did not go on to say how their relationship developed from that point. Well, that's not inconsistent with some of the things that Robin D'Angelo says in White Fragility, because she says you take away from the conversation when you talk about the impact on you as opposed to uh, allowing for uh, the African-American community to discuss how they see racism. So that's totally consistent with what she has said in her book. Um, and, yep. and again, you know, the reason why it got so much attention is because it's so provocative and it might represent one half of 1% of what's in the statement. I mean, I don't know what's in the statement, but then it became the focus of the entire discussion. Now, how often do you agree with 100% of what's written in terms of any platform, right? Wait a minute, but what, what it was saying, it, it may be two sentences, but it, if, if somebody accused me in, a, uh, in one sentence of a thousand page thing of murder, uh, I would say, no, that's wrong. Oh, and sure. it's, not, it's not all about me. And, and that, that's what happened here. I, I think it was, it was I, I, I would really like to know how it, how it came in. But I mean, it, it, uh, I thought it was, I thought it was appalling. And, and not just not, and I'm not sort of focusing back on me. I was very, very, very positive about Black Lives Matter and obviously what went on in at Ferguson and Brown and all, all that stuff was horrible. Right. But putting that in, it deprived me of the opportunity to be part of that group. Right. Said, you're not, you're not welcome. I just, that was exactly my reaction as well. And unnecessarily so. My understanding is that there's, there's more than one group. I, I think it was said earlier as well, that there's a group that, my understanding is how, of how this group is organized is that it's very diffuse that there are people who have taken up the charge or the, or the slogan of Black Lives Matter and they call themselves and they rally around that, but, you, but you, it's not one organization. And I think that the, the effect of this, this discussion about, or the, or the concern that that very inflammatory and provocative stuff, um, what it elicited is like a complete um, disassociation from any concern about the people who originally started Black Lives Matter in Ferguson. Sandy, you, you said you knew something about the folks in Memphis. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any internal experience to show or to discuss how this works out. Because, you know, even the, the article that was shared said it was a group that was affiliated with. And I mean, I, I went on, the, on a website to try to find the platform and it took me a while to find it because I had to find something, a website that said the movement for black lives, which is not the same as blacklivesmatter.org. So I just want to try to understand what, what your understanding is as somebody who knew the, in the organization more closely from the inside. I think that, you, that there is a distinction also between the local organizations and the national organizations. I'm not so sure that there is a national organization. I think it's much more diffuse than that. And the fact is, the statement for the, the, for the movement for Black Lives or whatever it was called, is not a statement that came from Black Lives Matter. But it is a statement that a lot of groups signed on to, including Black Lives Matter. 
but when, I mean, frequently an organization will, because uh, I don't think Linda Sarsour, for example, has been some sort of a master leader of Black Lives Matter. Um, and she, she's been involved with the Women's March, not directly Black Lives Matter. And, and I think um, somebody said, you know, you, you, organizations sign on to things when they, when they preponderantly agree with the statement. If the, the only way groups can work together is if they craft something that they can all kind of agree on, even if they don't agree on with everything. I mean, I, I was part of, a, of, a, of an organization that uh, Dan Siegel knows well, um, that essentially signed on to nothing because they would find a sentence that they didn't like. So if, if the organization didn't write it, then they wouldn't sign on to it. But had that organization written it, some other organization wouldn't have liked it. Yes. I, I do think we, we Jews need to be a little careful, especially in dealing with racism, um, of making everything about ourselves. Wait a minute, you're talking genocide. You're not talking, well, from, you know, you know one yeah, thing. Yeah, but, 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 but what does it matter? First of all, okay. A lot, of matter? a lot of the Palestinians have been killed by Israelis, and sometimes they have been killed by Israelis for no particular reason. Okay, we're not, we're, so, I presume, uh, George, you're not, you're not actually agreeing that Israel's uh, genocidal. No, I'm not, and I, but mm -hmm. what I am saying is that the, it, it's a statement. It, 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 it has no, it has no practical significance. Certainly not for the black people who, uh, about whom this whole statement was written. Um, okay. So it, let's just say it, that we're all right. And, um, Batya, may I yeah. make a quick point, please? This is Candy Berlin speaking. Okay. Um, two things here. One is because of our history, Jewish people's history, we may be hyper vigilant, maybe internalize that hyper vigilance, right? to be concerned about our own survival and threats to our own survival. So being singled out is very nervous making for us. We, we have a bad history of being singled out, right? That's number one. Um, number two is that in um, speaking about um, how that line might have gotten in to the um, platform. Um, I don't think Jews in general, I could be wrong, but I don't think we would be so concerned with that line in the platform. We might just think, okay, it's one of many views they have. If there had been other lines in the Black Lives Matter platform that dealt with international issues and um, the many, many countries in the world that actually do commit um, acts of um, genocide and violence against groups of people. So I, just to put that in context, I think there's real reasons why Jews would be concerned about that line. Um, and I'm not saying that we all have to take the same view of it, but there's a, a real issue there. That's it. And, and those are the reasons we started last week's conversations talking about our Jewish identities and what is anti-Semitism. Because again, I think as Jews, we go into this conversation um, with our own history of anti-Semitism and knowing, you know, knowing how to distinguish that from the, discuss the discussion about racism is important, even though it's who we are, we're gonna be who we are. But I, I don't want, I mean, we could easily spend you know, four weeks talking about the Black Lives Matter uh, platform, and I don't want to do that. So I want to move on to the next moment in history that, that's like easy to pin down as a moment. Women's March. All right, so, um, and again, I don't want to get overly focused on the Women's March as one thing, right? I want to talk about 
these things as moments in a developing relationship that waxes and wanes, right? The Black Lives Matter movement's platform on Israel is important because it highlights an issue that is ongoing, how Israel is viewed, right? Um, the issue of the Women's March, and I actually want to be sure that we have time to touch on, we're done at 8.30, right? So I'm going to have to be a little more corrective, right? The, the Women's March and the leadership of the Women's March and to what degree they were anti-Semitic is another moment and it is emblematic of Jews feeling excluded from a place where they were supportive of an issue and they wanted to be engaged and they felt unwelcome. We felt unwelcome, generally speaking. Um, the, the text that I have here for is the Women March melting down. Um, that the reason I brought that text instead of uh, Mercy Morgenfeld's actual statement is I can't find her statement anymore. So if you go back to my old computer or my old job, I have it saved. And it, it's a lovely statement that just said, anti-Semitism isn't acceptable. And the leadership of the National Women's March, she was the head of the DC Women's March, has no place bringing anti-Semitism into the conversation. Essentially, that was her rebuke. Now, her, I seem to be in, into the word rebuke today, right? Her statement is no longer available online. She took it off Twitter. She took it off, um, you, you can't Google it and search it. I couldn't find it anywhere. So I was left bringing you little yeah. bits of it from an Algeminer article. Um, but again, it's the cart. It's sort of another yeah. moment where you see the, the ways in which this relationship is not an easy one. There are many Jews that are very committed to opposing racism, and then they find themselves excluded from spaces. Um, the Dyke March is a good example. Um, these, the, so the, the, the story at the Dyke March was there was a group of women there who had a rainbow flag with a star in the middle and they were asked to leave because it was triggering because it looked too much like the Israeli flag. So the, this act of excluding people from the, from the space because they possibly supported Israel or they were Jews, so they likely supported Israel. They, so they were not welcome and they were excluded. Um, I am told by the woman who was thrown out of the Dyke March, they'd been bringing that flag to the Dyke March for 10 years. Like it was not new for them to be there with that flag. But that year they were asked to leave. Right. Is, okay. that, is, is the Women's March akin to Black people? Because I think what, in this conversation, I think what is missing is we're talking about movements or individual, um, like uh, Walter, Walter Reed, I think we were talking about. Um, and something Martin Luther King said, or something, um, something James Baldwin said, that's not indicative of the entire black community. And there is no, there is nothing that is indicative of any right. entire community. That's, that's what I'm getting. And I feel like in this conversation, we're saying Jews as a community and blacks as a community, but I, I don't feel like we're getting at what the relationship between blacks and Jews are necessarily. The Women's March is definitely not, I didn't attend the Women's March. As a black person, as a black woman who sees herself as a black feminist specifically, um, when we're talking about intersectionality, I don't attend the Women's March because it seems very much more um, geared toward white women, right? But I don't think, I think it, it feels like in this conversation, or I'm gonna, I'm just speaking from how it feels for me in this conversation, is that because Black, you know, elites or um, some, which is which is a small, uh, albeit a very small portion of people, have said some things that have hurt Jews' feelings or put some Jews in a, a certain context that they don't like to be in. Then that's why they there. That's why we can't fight for um, equality and not racism as a whole because someone said something or because one group said something that I can't support 
black people in their movement or fight for equality to not be killed by police or to see, serve equal rights. I think and, and one of the things that, I, that, that you said that kind of struck me was that things were different before this administration. It absolutely was not. Um, I will say I dealt with, I deal with students, um, black, white, um, and Jewish students all the time, it, if we're classifying those differently. I had to uh, console a lot of white and Jewish white students after Trump was elected because they felt so horrible that this could happen in their country. Yeah. I felt no different. It feels exactly the same. Do we see, am I seeing it more? Absolutely. But does it feel different? Absolutely not. And maybe for Jews, it feels different now because they're being parsed out with things like Charlottesville, but it, do, it doesn't feel different for a young, under, I'm under 40 black person in my lifetime. I've experienced racism coming directly from Jews and being told that they have to get used to my presence, that maybe I got into the school I got into because I was black and an affirmative action and that I'm angry when they meet me or I could be nicer. If the reason for, for you to help black people in their fight for equality, much like Jews need, wanted to exist and have equality, um, is that I need to be nice to you, then that's a problem. And I think we, instead of talking about text that uh, James Baldwin said, because we can also talk about the text that Muhammad Ali said, if there's 10,000 snakes coming at me, should I open the door for 1,000 nice ones? Are we talking about what's happening now? Are we talking about what's happening in this country? Are we upset at Linda Sarsour, who's not, who's a person of color, but not a black person and calling her anti-Semitic? Are we helping are we looking at uh, what's happening in black communities? Are we looking at the, you know, are, are we upset that, you know, maybe Martin Luther King's uh, speech speech felt a little out outside or maybe he was rebuking something or is he calling to action? Are Jews being active in this country and not centering themselves in a conversation where they get to be white if they want to be? Right? Like, I don't get to be white if I want to be ever. I could marry a white person and now he experiences more racism than me experiencing less. Like, are we, are we really fighting for that? And that's really something that I feel like is lacking in this conversation that's over in three minutes. And are, are, we, are we saying that black people should do more, should, should be nicer to Jews to, for them to fight for us? Because if that's the case, then that's not necessarily going to happen. You're going to find black people who are angry and Jew, a lot of Jews who are silent in the face of racism when it comes to black people in America. Right, but I think that we have to try to make meaning and make sense of what is happening around us. I don't think any of these texts or any of these incidents have in one way slowed down the way I'm trying to learn to be an anti-racist or whatever. It hasn't stopped me one iota. But on the other hand, I need to make me, make sense out of these texts or I'm going, you know, I'm not going to be engaged in, in understanding the world around me. I need to understand what's happening. And that's why I appreciate these discussions uh, and the comments from, uh, you know, I appreciate the texts and I appreciate you, the, the people, but I have to pay attention to what's happening. Um, and to be honest with you, I'm struggling. I feel like I, I'm struggling with it. Look at us, the two of us live together. I mean, you know, we're, yeah, right, we're partners. I, we, we go at this all the time. We spend a lot of time with these texts. And um, I think that's important. It's an important, uh, you know, struggle. You know, and, and like the Dyke March, to me, that was like a knife in my heart. Like, what? They got thrown out of the march because of the flag? Yeah, it did. It, the, it hurts. It hurts. I, think, I mean, I think, too, when we're looking at that, then we need to look at what we are up against, right? Instead of separating our, our, our struggles, we need to look at the reason that they've had to parse out so many things so separately is white supremacy. Right, like if, if white people are not able to um, tie themselves to it, if they can, if they can, much like uh, in in Nazi Germany, much like in uh, America, the Americas when slavery was happening, if you can put them and pit them against each other, they will fight and they won't fight us. And that's kind of what we're what I'm looking at, like. I, you know, do am I am I agreeing with what Walter Reed said? Am I agreeing with what 
with what uh, not Walter Reed. Walter Roger White. White. Walter White. Walter White. Sorry, I was I was about to say Walter Cronkite. So all all bets were off at that point. But are, am I looking at that? Am I attaching myself to everything the Black Lives Matter movement does? Am I attaching? Like I can I can sit in this conversation with all Black people and not agree with them or who may be homophobic. Like I'm not for that, but I still need to be for the overall. We can we have those. Maybe we need to have a, a separate conversation about how it is to live with a Black per, a Black person and a Jewish person. But we have those conversations. It just feels like we're spending so much time or so much energy on what one person said and how that affected all Jews. Because if that's the case, if I, if I walk through the world like that, I would, I would hate the Jewish community because of what one Jewish person did to me. That does not make sense. Are we looking at the, t you can, but I'm sure if you can find, if we can find some of this text, we can also find text that says there are Jews doing great things. There are blacks who are helping Jews that, you know what I mean? Like I, we have to look at that as well. And I, I, I just, I don't feel like we're getting to that in this in this one hour conversation saying this is the problem or that happened or this really happened here. It's really hurtful to me to sit here as one of two or I can't see the entire screen of black people here. Well, black people could do this better. better. Why are they treating so us? Let better? me interrupt you because I want to take a turn. <laughs> I apologize if I didn't have more explicitly racist texts from Jews in this conversation. When I that, that, feels, that feels a little pointed. It's not that I'm looking for explicitly racist text. I'm looking for where do we come together? Why can we come together and how versus whether Jews are also very, very racist um, because I think it's also a difference when Jews get to be white. Let's, if we're having that conversation, let's have that conversation. If we're talking about where, where our groups separate and why and then where they come together and why I think it's bigger than just uh, do because I, I mean the average black person now is not looking at whether Jews support Palestine or Israel. That's not the entire Jewish community. Ahmad Aubrey is running and he's not thinking. Well, this white guy could be Jewish. He's thinking I got killed by a white person and who who's who's supporting me. It's not that we don't see these things happening. That that's that's not the entire black community. We're not all Black Lives Matter. We're not. We're just living and trying to live. And that's, I think, what we need to be talking about a little bit better. I'm not looking for, hey, I'm not, I didn't come to this conversation or marrying a Jewish person thinking, well, your people are racist, so how are you gonna fix that for us? That's not, that's not the conversation that we're having. And I would add to that, that this conversation at least was able to highlight the fact that the, the Black Lives Matter platform got the most attention because of that, uh, that offensive, and inflammatory language, it got more attention to the number of black unarmed people who've been killed. I mean, there, there's a huge number of people. And it's like, every time I turn around, I, I turned around and I said, was it always like this or is it cell phones that's made the difference? I don't know. But well, in the beginning of this conversation, I did mention the cell phones, I think. And I do think that cell phones made a huge difference. And just to speak to Arlene and Tyshell, um, I, for one, I can't speak for everybody in this conversation. There's a lot of people here. Um, but I am an unflagging ally of Black Lives Matter. I am unabashedly supportive as Israel, of Israel as a concept. And I'm opposed to many of the policies of the Israel government. But hey, I live in a country where I fucking hate the government right now. Or at least the part of it that is so harmful to our lives. Um, so I just want to say that it's a complex conversation. Um, you, you know, you're both touching on things here that are, um, they're difficult, they're painful. We have a very diverse group here, even among the white Jews, right? It's a diverse group. We're trying to have a conversation that takes a look at our history. It's, a, um, it's maybe more than we can talk about this time. You know, th there's a lot here, but I hear you. I think it's also a strategic mistake for, I mean, I participated in the Women's March and I was offended by the statement of uh, whatever her name was, Linder. Um, and, you know, I think it's a strategic mistake for certain groups to, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like how Trump has engaged in the, with the white working class in trying to pit them against immigrants, okay? Because then the enemy becomes those folks 
as opposed to who the real enemy is in term within the org within the, the you know the, the country and i think that strategically um you know you start fighting the wrong enemy i mean you start and you start diluting the whole um focus and and the potential of greater support of a larger community and um you know the other thing is i have to say as well is that as jews many of us have not been willing to have a serious conversation um about israel and and the palestinians and um i th i have friends that live in israel that can have those conversations but if you raise them within the jewish community it it's it's very very difficult because um just because you criticize israel doesn't mean that you're against israel that you're an anti-zionist but it's a very very um difficult conversation for jews to have in this country and there and israelis are more apt to be able to have that conversation from my experience so you know there are a couple of things going on here i mean i'm trying to make two different points the first, one point is that we still need to have that conversation i don't believe it you know genocide is a loaded word of course but there are differences in terms of how Jews feel about certain policies of Israel, okay? And a lot of times if you mention anything against Israel, you're considered anti-Semitic. And I don't think that's a valid conclusion. Um, on the other hand, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the women's movement should be more strategic in terms of identifying, um, you know, getting support for what they do, and then as a result, being more sensitive to the policies they they embrace. And so, I also wanted to say that um, the original intent, intent, as I understand it, of these discussions was for white Jews to sit around and talk about racism. And so, um, clearly, we're going to do that through the screen of our experiences. So um, while I hear your frustration and I'm not delegitimizing it, I'm just trying to say, maybe because your expectations of this discussion were different than the original intent and why the majority of the group thought they were coming to talk. Yes. Uh, as, we, as we want to be working to oppose racism, it helps if we understand our own issues and where we're coming from. Right? One, of the, one of the perspectives on the history of the relationship between communities, which is fabulously complex and has waxed and waned, that has many people who have different perspectives, but of many of the issues and strains on that, those perspectives have been the same throughout the decades. For many people coming to this conversation, they have a sense that the Jews were always nice to the black people and what went wrong? Why did they, what happened? How did they not notice how wonderful we are? And if we're going to have real conversations, we need to understand that that is a false narrative. There were many times when the Jewish and Black communities as institutionally worked together in very powerful ways. Um, even at those times, the relationship was not perfect. Different perspective, different experiences. Being Jewish in America is not the same thing as being Black in America. So we know that there's not going to be perfect agreement but understanding that that understanding that we have, we both communities have so much to gain by working together has kept both communities engaged with one another. Um, we need to remember the ways in which we have supported one another um, and not the ways that Jews have, uh, that Jews have been there for the black community, which is the way that many people engage this issue. And that 
perspective is not only fabulously patronizing, it is also spectacularly incorrect. The Howard University um, recently received an award, an award from the Embassy of Israel for their admitting in Jewish students to their medical and dental schools when white universities wouldn't um, admit Jews. Um, the historic black colleges and universities, universities took in refugee professors who were Jewish from Germany because they couldn't get jobs in, in Ivy League schools. Right. This is the, the relationship of mutual support despite the areas of conflict are because we are committed to a pluralistic America that is just and equitable. Since we are coming at it from fabulously different levels of class and privilege, it's not always a smooth fit. Um, but understanding the ways in which we all benefit by working together for the best country we can have that is truly just um, is an important goal. And having the opportunity to understand what we might have under misunderstood or to grapple with our own challenges, um, that's important. It's a worthwhile conversation. This is not the end of the conversation. Right? This is the beginning of understanding, understanding how we can engage in dialogue and engage in the work of working for the entire community. We want to, I mean, it is better to go into a conversation with some self-awareness. And, and hopefully we've had a chance to start exploring those ideas. Uh, last week and this week. Next week's conversation, um, we're going to be talking, it's going to shift a little bit, right? This week was very, aimed at being very historical. Um, last week was very personal. Next week, we're engage, going to engage how the Jewish community has been um, dealing with its own diversity. And um, there's, uh, I, um, I'll try to share the documents a little earlier. I, J Jason has made it clear that I need to do that. The uh, Mara God, who wrote the book Color of Love, recently had an article in Tablet talking about her experience at the Union of Reform Ju uh, Judaism Conference. Um, and there are a number of articles out that we'll be sending out. Um, understanding the experience of Jews of color and black Jews within our communities and how our community um, hopefully makes that a comfortable space and in which ways they don't um, is, an import, is important as we continue working through how do we want to engage issues of racism. Um, Jared Jackson, the executive director of Jews in All Hues is planning on coming for the conversation next week. Um, I've asked a couple of members of BZBI who are black to join us as well, talk about their own experiences. Um, and I've asked uh, um, one of the women from the Evaluations Department of Jewish Federation that did the POP study to come and talk about what the actual statistics are on Jews of color in greater Philadelphia. But we want to be clear, these are all introductions to the subject, and so we have a place to start the conversations. Right? Ultimately, we need to understand what are the steps that we can make in order to work for a better world. Um, Rebecca and I were talking about you know, possibilities, one of which was a book club. And I'm actually suggesting this one as a good book to start with. The Human Relations Commission is going to be bringing in the author to speak about housing policy and how, how housing policy deliberately segregated America, federal what's, housing policy. What's the name of that book? I'm sorry. The Color of Law. The Color Cal of Law 
uh, a, forgot, a Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. Right. Okay. Um, and so far we haven't really had time to get to something a little bit more concrete. But again, these are just initial conversations and I really want to thank everyone for, for participating and being so open. Thank you. This is great. Have a great week, everyone. Happy Memorial Day. Thank Stay you. safe. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.